The unveiling of a national security law for Hong Kong is, to say the least, unnerving this city of more than 7 million. <laughs> and leaves little doubt who's in charge. Beijing wants order restored and national security ensured, no matter the cost. After a year of pro-democracy unrest, Beijing is coming down hard and fast. Okay, the Hong Kong police have just raised the banner of the same. That this gathering of people is in violation of the law. They're asking people to disperse or they will use force. Hundreds were arrested on the first day of the law. A police officer was even stabbed. The tension is so high in large part because the new law is much tougher than many had imagined. Because few, if any in Hong Kong, had even seen the complete final draft before it was hastily approved, imposed and enforced by Beijing in time for the July 1st anniversary of the 97 handover. <laughs> Chanting or displaying slogans of independence are now illegal in a city where free speech is prized and protected. The new law is extremely bad. It takes away the freedom of every Hong Kong citizen. So I think every Hong Kong citizen uh, has to stand up and oppose it. So what's happened to Hong Kong now? It's a police day. I forewarn uh, uh, those radicals uh, not to attempt to violate uh, this law or crossing the red line because the consequences of breaching this law are very serious. Many in this polarized city, though, do welcome the firmer hand, fed up with the acts of violence and vandalism. Hong Kong belongs to China. Others are still trying to let the new reality sink in. I just come on the street to celebrate. <laughs> You're celebrating? What are you celebrating? Celebrate the end of the one country, two system. The law has been passed already, so I can't say anything. Everyone has to be much more careful than before. I don't think I can make it more blunt. Will the opposition in Hong Kong stand down for the sake of stability or stare down this new mandate from Beijing? Hong Kong is, to this day, a city on edge. Hello and welcome to this second installment of the Bloomberg Television series, Hong Kong On Edge. I'm Stephen Engel. Well, much has transpired since chaos erupted in Hong Kong in 2019, initially in defiance of Carrie Lam's extradition bill that was eventually scrapped. But the die was cast. Violent protests were met with stiffer police retaliation, a standoff that deepened the political divide and the economic damage. And while the coronavirus outbreak created a lull, Beijing drafted its tailor-made national security law, akin to antivirus software, is how some Chinese officials have called it, to rid Hong Kong of subversive forces. The law is a sword hanging above an extremely small number of criminals who are severely endangering national security. But the ripple effects of this new law are being felt worldwide as Western nations weigh sanctions and global tech platforms from the likes of Google, Facebook, TikTok and others question whether they can continue to do business here without having to hand over user data if asked. The content of the law is the worst you know, uh, form I would have expected. It really created enormous chilling effect. For Hong Kong On Edge 2, we cast a wide net assembling interviews with some of the more pivotal figures in this evolving story. We must note, though, most of these discussions were held in the days immediately leading up to the implementation of the new security law. From the Hong Kong government, we speak with two of Chief Executive Carrie Lam's top cabinet officials, Financial Secretary Paul Chan and Justice Secretary Teresa Chang. I am definitely standing up for the rule of law in Hong Kong. A sentiment not shared by the pro-democracy camp we speak with the former student activist turned face of the anti-government protest, Joshua Wong, as well as opposition lawmaker and sharp critic of Beijing, Claudia Mo. Plus, two former Hong Kong Democratic Party chairmen, Albert Ho and Emily Lau. Beijing's coming down on us like a ton of bricks. 
Plus, we speak with the Hong Kong business community, including the chairman of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, Laura Cha, the head of Crown Worldwide Moving Company, and the former chairman of the American Chamber of Commerce here, Jim Thompson, children's clothing chain owner, Herbert Chow, and property tycoon, Alan Zeman, a Hong Kong citizen and economic advisor to the chief executive. It is one country, two systems, but it's one country first, two systems come second. And for the historical perspective, we sit down with two key figures from the British handover, Hong Kong's first Justice Secretary post-97, Elsie Lung, and the last British governor of Hong Kong, who's been vilified by Beijing for introducing democratic reforms to the city pre-handover, Chris Patton. I'm not in favor of a Cold War against China. I am in favor of calling out China when it behaves intolerably badly. And lastly, we do hear from Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam, albeit from a Bloomberg Television interview in January in Davos. She wasn't available in time for this program due to a scheduling conflict. Well, there is no truth in the allegation that the central government is tightening its grip on Hong Kong. You be the judge of that. Convictions under the four main crimes in the new security law, subversion, secession, terrorism, and collusion with foreign forces all carry maximum life sentences. Cases for the most part will be handled by Hong Kong courts, but by judges picked by the chief executive, who's accountable to Beijing. Some more complex cases could be tried on the mainland. Some trials involving state secrets will be closed and possibly without juries. A new law enforcement body from the mainland has been created with investigative authority and immunity. Police, too, will have sweeping new powers, including the ability to search without warrants. And the law can be applied to anyone, anywhere in the world. National security is an issue at the country level. Just look at any other international financial center. They do have national security law. So from that perspective, we are no different than the others. I think first and foremost, it is a matter of confidence. People will see that it will not affect the core value of Hong Kong. The core value being the rule of law, um, a fair and transparent market, uh, uh, integrity of the market, and a level playing field where everyone is treated the same. Like many people, I'm totally taken by surprise, totally astonished by this move. Because over long, um, our understanding of this one country, two, two system policy and the concept of high degree of autonomy is that the main authority is not supposed to make law directly for Hong Kong. Do you think it's illegal? I think it's unconstitutional. Unconstitutional. It's against the basic spirit enshrined in the basic law. Article 18 of Hong Kong's mini-constitution, the Basic Law, states that mainland Chinese law shall not be applied in Hong Kong except for those listed in Annex 3, which is where this new law has been added. It allows Beijing flexibility to add or delete legislation based on new threats to national security, but it stipulates Beijing must consult with the government of Hong Kong. By most accounts, it did very little of that. Many of those national security protections, though, are already laid out in Article 23 of the Basic Law, which stipulates Hong Kong must enact security laws on its own. The problem is, the local legislative council has failed since 1997 to implement Article 23, as it's required to do, on fears it could limit people's rights. So Beijing bypassed local lawmakers. The mainland authority decided that they have to make sure that this law is in pass to protect their interests. It's not just about Hong Kong. They are worried about the foreign forces who will be using Hong Kong to destabilize the mainland. So they have to pass this law to protect their interests as well. And we failed that. We failed to do so 23 years. And unfortunately, yeah, this time around, I don't think there's much of an input from our side. But I think it really surprised everyone during the outbreak of COVID-19. Beijing just took the advantage and to introduce the national security law. And compared to the context or the framework um, of the extradition bill, the national security legislation is more damaging to the autonomy and uh, it just broke the promise of the joint declaration. So in essence, the street protests that you were part of once you mm. were released from jail contributed to a worst case scenario. 
I disagree with this statement. I think under the hardline rule of President Xi Jinping, no matter the extradition bill withdraw or not, Beijing will still try to implement the anti-subversion regulation to this global city. Nobody knew in Hong Kong. Nobody knew it was coming. The Carrie Lam, the chief executive, and all her team did not know. It was sprung on them and sprung on the whole world. I mean, so complete lack of respect for Hong Kong, and it's not the first time. So game over, right? Beijing has won, right? Well, I think it's far too early to say that, but it's going to be very rough. Well, I, I can say categorically it's going to be very good for Hong Kong. Why do we need it? Because exactly of what has happened in particular in the last um, six months of uh, 2019, and of course also the fact the social unrest and a lot of people actually chanting slogans of independence. Now, Hong, Hong Kong never actually had any independence movement. It's been uh, drummed up. That was a cultural revolutionary tactic, and that is uh, uh, the, uh, seducing <laughs> the snake uh, to get out of uh, uh, the hole. And uh, the, the young fell for it. I don't think that the, what happened in the past 12 months is only uh, social issues. I mean, it is clear that uh, the, the, some of the writers uh, aim at secession separate uh, Hong Kong independence. I don't think Beijing is right in saying that we have to have the national security law because some people here working with foreign forces are hell-bent on trying to create independence here or turn Hong Kong into a semi-independent state and they also want to turn Hong Kong into a base for subverting and overthrowing the Chinese Communist Party. That's what they're saying. But the people I know, many of them they are not determined to do that, but what they are determined is to hold Beijing's feet to the fire, not to breach the joint declaration and the basic law. Up next. Some people here in the crowded shopping district of Causeway Bay on Hong Kong Island are openly defying the new national security law, which was really implemented on Hong Kong just a few hours ago. It's an open test to the prized independent judiciary here in Hong Kong. Many opponents of the national security law say it will be used to accomplish the political goals of the Communist Party of China. Indeed, indeed. That is exactly what is going to happen. People are worried. Families were moving away. I, I don't blame China for saying, hey, okay, guys, enough. I think the, uh, the national security law um, do have an impact on market information flow. Market information, if it's flowing freely, will let the financial market to price uh, assets uh, efficiently. And I think that without market information flow, uh, Hong Kong uh, international financial centers is, is at risk. Every time Hong Kong comes back stronger, more resilient, reinvents itself, I believe as strongly in the future of Hong Kong. Welcome back to Hong Kong on Edge 2 on Bloomberg Television. I'm Stephen Engel. Now, the new national security law represents an uneasy marriage between China's socialist legal system and Hong Kong's common law preserved since the British left in 1997. Now, officials talk of the national security law being a sword of Damocles, a threat to the people to stay in line. The problem is, most here don't know where the legal boundaries lie. All parties should abide by rules and should not breach the bottom line. I think the opposition fronts in Hong Kong should seriously reflect on themselves and make some adjustment. I think the most important aspect one would want to see is the definition of the offenses uh, because of course these are national security concepts in most countries especially in democratic countries they're defined very narrowly so that they they protect rights and don't go farther than they're needed um, on the mainland we see that they're defined very widely uh, leading to uh, you know very vague uh, interpretations uh, and possible abusive uses Legal certainty is critical to Hong Kong's financial hub success. So is risking that a worthy trade-off for the sake of stability through a controversial national law? Without um, national security, I think you cannot, you cannot carry on business, you cannot improve our social situation, you cannot achieve universal suffrage. So if you, we do not resolve this question of national security, we cannot 
deal with any other problem. So I think we have to bite the bullet. The lesser of two evils, maybe, is the way you put it? Uh, well, I mean, no matter what price we pay, we have to do it. Really, the biggest issue will be, does the changes that are being made to how the judiciary functions in this very specific area of national security law, um, will that start to impact how the judiciary operates in commercial areas? And that is an open question, but, but really a very, very important one. Another concern is the judges who handle the cases under the security law are appointed by the chief executive. It begs the question, does that blur the line between executive and judicial powers? No, I think that um, the judicial independence means judges are independent um, in the administration of justice in judging cases, and that cannot be interfered with. What sort of rule of law system allows the executive, allows the plaintiff in a case to pick the judges, particularly and if the plaintiff, i.e. the government, is being advised by um, a, a Chinese communist official from Beijing, which is what's going to happen. You have in Hong Kong the common law system, and imposing on it what passes for the law in China um, will produce chaos or else will produce the sort of decisions which will be intolerable for people in Hong Kong, and sooner or later, will be intolerable for business as well. The important thing, which I think both in Hong Kong and in the mainland we would be looking to, is that the laws have to be clear so people know when they are overstepping the limits and the courts and uh, our department will know when and how to apply the law in making prosecutorial decisions and in making adjudications before the court. I think we need to emphasize the key point about the national security law is it could let Beijing appoint agent or secret police to arrest people in Hong Kong and the prosecution or the trial might not take place in Hong Kong. Well they say yeah, it might take place say, in mainland China. They, we know what's happened of the Causeway book publisher incident, how a uh, Hong Kong uh, book publisher have been physically kidnapped from Hong Kong to mainland China. Which goes back to the issue that sparked the unrest a year ago. Carrie Lam's extradition bill. got shelved but may get new life in a way through the national security law with the added teeth of having mainland law enforcement agents positioned in Hong Kong and the fact some sensitive cases can be tried in China. They may take up exceptional cases, okay, maybe a small number of people but they can change it. They can directly handle the situation, put the law into their hand or even be a judge over these cases. Now this become extremely varying. Already, the US, UK, Canada, and Australia have suspended their extradition treaties with Hong Kong as a result. If you look at the national security law of the mainland of the People's Republic of China, you can see that they cannot exceed their authority, they cannot abuse their authority. But you understand, you understand the concern of whether it's an activist or a religious leader. Uh, these kinds of laws, on the mainland at least, have been used to quiet dissent. Yes, I mean, they should look at what happened in the past 23 years, whether they have faith in the Hong Kong system. If they do, then I don't think the uh, proposed legislation will change our system. No, it would not. I think China's been pretty fair to Hong Kong all the way down the line, and I think the only reason they're actually jumping into the picture here is not because they want to you know, put some new clamps on it, but I think they want to get Hong Kong back to stability. And I think I as a citizen and I as a businessman feel that as well. I think that the biggest you know, disruption to Hong Kong has been you know, people on the streets. I think they definitely brought it on themselves. Well, there's a reason they don't want it here, because they don't want to have what happened to the booksellers, you know, well, heisted out of Hong Kong when you think, in the dark of night into wouldn't a very wouldn't it be better system. Wouldn't it be better to have a law instead of him, having them kidnapping and the person is <laughs> So they're say, legalizing the kidnapping. Yeah. Well, I mean, at least the, the, kidna the people who are being kidnapped would have a legal process to go through in, in Hong Kong and, you know, they wouldn't be But we're kidnapped. getting to the root of it now, Jim, mm -hmm. because, look, they published books that were critical of Xi Jinping. Yeah. Isn't that against also one of the tenets, or several of the tenets of mm. the basic law, freedom of speech. Yeah, it is, and you know, I can't defend that in any way. I think if you live in these countries, you just, you know, got to play by the rules. It's absolutely crazy, and, and it's, it's designed to ensure that the Hong Kong um, uh, freedoms 
autonomy that we've uh, regarded as being guaranteed until 2047 um, are put in put on ice, they got rid of, uh, in order for uh, the uh, Chinese equivalent of the KGB to be able to uh, run Hong Kong in whatever ways they want. China's new law enforcement body for Hong Kong will have immunity. That's important because Carrie Lam refused to set up an independent commission to investigate last year's violence by and against the police. Instead, she stuck to findings of an internal police complaints council, the IPCC, which critics say was independent in name only. The final report gave more than 50 recommendations for operational improvements, but it largely exonerated officers of accusations they used excessive force. When talk about the uniqueness of Hong Kong, we always emphasize the importance of rule of law. But since last year, we always in Hong Kong, we were described as rule by tear gas. The IPCC had input from foreign experts but they all abruptly resigned before the findings were released. One was Dr. Clifford Stott of Keele University, who told the Foreign Correspondents Club of Hong Kong the IPCC replicated the structural biases of the political system in Hong Kong. I believe in the end we were put in a really, really difficult position. Um, we, we were essentially, in the end, I feel manipulated. Oh, that is a joke. It's only intended to whitewash what the police have done in the past. And in fact, there has never been a thorough and in-depth investigation into some of the uh, incidents which, had, which should have called for, uh, which has aroused a lot of public concern and anger. In fairness, and I know many of the people on that commission. It wasn't even a was, commission, it was a, well, it was committee, a police committee. complaints I know, council. Yeah, I know, and I know so the head, the I know the investigating head investigating well. themselves. I sit on the board with, 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 uh, with the head of the, of the council. They're pretty fair people, but we do have an independent judiciary, so I do trust the judges that we have, and many of those people that are in jail uh, or are serving prison, uh, and, and I feel very bad because many are young people who have screwed up their life to have a record. Listen, I wouldn't like to be the guy that got that got his face scarred, and one, one yeah. guy walking along the street, a brick hit him in the head and he passed yeah. away, he died. What about those people? I mean, there's two sides. I think the government, or well, the central government, decided that in the interim, while they are not willing to um, give in on anything, the interim solution is to use our police force to turn it into a bit of, little bit of like a police state. The police don't want to be out there uh, but anyway, they'd love to just be giving parking tickets if they need to be. The thing is to bring stability back for everyone. Business likes stability. Up next. Without question, the Hong Kong economy has been absolutely hammered over the past year, whether it's because of the U.S.-China trade war, the ongoing protests, or the coronavirus outbreak. Many companies here are keeping their collective heads low. Some, though, are not afraid to show how they really feel. We'll have that story coming up next on Hong Kong On Edge. After the, the poor policy implementation of the Hong Kong government, my business is in shambles. We still have free flow of capital, separate customs territory. Um, we control the currency, Hong Kong dollar, etc. So, so far as business is concerned, it is not going to be affected. Hong Kong is no longer sufficiently autonomous to warrant the special treatment that we have afforded the territory since the handover. There is no need for any external force to interfere. Welcome back to Hong Kong On Edge 2 on Bloomberg Television. I'm Stephen Engel. So much has been made about whether Hong Kong's position as an international finance center is in jeopardy as the violence and legal upheaval possibly drive people and capital away. But also, Hong Kong seemingly is caught in a vice between dueling superpowers in a battle of trade, ideologies, and ultimately, supremacy. We're in a technology cold war between the U.S. and China, and that was before coronavirus. And Hong Kong is going to get squeezed. Please don't go back! Please don't go back! 
Under the U.S.-Hong Kong Policy Act of 1992, Washington has treated Hong Kong differently to the Chinese mainland in trade, commerce and other areas as long as Hong Kong maintained its high degree of autonomy from China as laid out in the basic law. Free Hong Kong was one of the world's most stable, prosperous and dynamic cities. Now, now it will be just another communist-run city where its people will be subject to the party elite's whims. In light of the new security law, President Trump ordered an end to Hong Kong's special status and signed legislation that would sanction Chinese officials deemed to be suppressing rights in the city. Additionally, the move would ban the export of sensitive technologies to Hong Kong and eliminate preferences for Hong Kong passport holders. We are not going to be deterred by such actions. If necessary, I believe the country will take measures to counter that. There is broad bipartisan concern about the behavior of uh, the government in Beijing. The only reason Donald Trump is doing this, or, his, or Pompeo, Secretary of State, is because they're adversaries with China right now. And, you know, they even say, why are we going to punish the Hong Kong people for something, for a problem we have with China? I'm not very at all. I'm doing the right thing, so why should I be fear? Fear is one thing, but a reality could be that you are sanctioned personally, whether it's assets overseas, mm -hmm. uh, visas to the United States. Well, if that really happened, it is just a small sacrifice. I won't be bothered. But it's not just governments taking action. Hours after Hong Kong announced sweeping new powers to police the Internet, Western tech companies such as Facebook, Google, Twitter, Microsoft and Zoom all froze requests for data from the Hong Kong government. Most Western social media platforms already are blocked on the mainland. Is Hong Kong heading for a similar chill in a financial city that craves a free flow of information? Not to mention, you know, professional people, talents, you know, they also find that, well, is it a place that they feel safe to live on is really the home that where, you know, that where they would raise the children. There would be a lot of self-censorship. What does it say to you about the international credibility, though, of Hong Kong? If, for example, a company like Google comes out and says, we're no longer going to provide data or information to authorities here in Hong Kong. You see that the international reputation of Hong Kong is severely damaged. So people um, doing business in Hong Kong, we have to rethink whether, you know, what, what, what are the additional premiums they have to pay for insuring against political risk and policy risk. I would not say this is a decoupling, but this is an adjustment uh, in the uh, relationship between the U.S. and Hong Kong. Uh, I do believe going forward we will still be enjoying a mutually beneficial uh, relationship. Let's talk about the dollar peg, which has served uh -huh. Hong Kong very well through mm -hmm. crises in the past. Without a doubt, in your mind, the peg stands? Sure, of course. Because, again, there is that so-called nuclear option that mm -hmm. Donald Trump could take and prevent Hong Kong from tapping into the clearing process mm -hmm. and selling U.S. dollars. What happens? He's unpredictable. We don't think we need to do any review on the link to exchange rate system. We stand firm to defend that. And the country will back us up in the defense of this link to exchange rate system. And in the context, we also consider Hong Kong, I mean, in Hong Kong, the U.S. has, has very significant economic and other interests. And Hong Kong is the third largest U.S. dollar forex trading center here, serving a lot of multinationals and other organizations in the region. The service is very wide ranging. So any sanction hampering or damaging our financial system will send wave shocks across the group to other financial markets, US included. That would also undermine investors' confidence in using US dollar and holding, holding US dollar financial assets. While U.S. action on the dollar peg is seen as unlikely, the American Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong says overall the removal of America's special status for Hong Kong will hurt U.S. interests here. People are saying in the short term, no plans to leave. In the medium to long term, people may be leaving in larger numbers.
While Hong Kong remains a key gateway from China to the rest of the world, it matters far less to China's fortunes than it once did. In 2019, just 12 percent of China's exports went to or through Hong Kong, down from 45 percent in 1992. Hong Kong, though, does have an open capital account and the adherence to international standards of governance unmatched by any mainland Chinese city. And it's an important base for global banks and trading firms. Hong Kong has been the connector between China and the West. Right. And that is a role that we will continue to play. Stability-wise, the central government is telling us just stay out of politics, all right? Build the economy, uh, go through innovation, build up livelihood, build bigger flats for people to live in, get more land, but stay away from politics. Well, that uh, goes back to uh, uh, money man's greed. So you are still eyeing at the uh, a vast China pie, the China market. You want a piece of it. So no matter what, uh, I will stay on because there's stu still money to make. And uh, if Hong Kong is not a safe place uh, to uh, do business, uh, when this uh, security chief here at the moment is very good at uh, portraying Hong Kong as some sort of uh, a cloak and dagger city, oh, it's full of spies, it's almost like uh, Berlin after or during the Cold War. Now, if uh, that's the case, uh, Hong Kong will uh, finally, finally, at the end of the day, dwindling away. But it won't be the death knell of Hong Kong. It'll just be a reimagination of Hong Kong, won't it? Because like you said, people still will chase the money and want to make money. They'll just play more by mainland rules. But the Hong Kong, the Hong Kong, we know is dead. You are seeing the facade, the front. Deep down, it's all rotten. Let's look at the case of HSBC. Some here criticized the bank for initially failing to publicly support the national security law when the London-based bank generates the majority of its profits from Hong Kong and China. When contacted by Bloomberg News, HSBC declined to comment. But it did eventually sign a joint statement with other banks in support of the new law, for which it took additional criticism from some in the West. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, for one, called it a corporate kowtow. Well, maybe, but why, why say kowtow? Maybe they actually feel, I know the CEO quite well, you know, and maybe he does really feel that, that uh, the security law will bring uh, stability back to Hong Kong. Well, it's very interesting that these, some of these firms have been signing up to the importance of this national security bill without ever knowing what's in it. I mean, I hope they're more careful about other matters um, in the interests of their shareholders, because otherwise um, uh, it doesn't say very much for their sense of uh, corporate uh, responsibility. I think the problem um, is that um, they're having to do um, business in a, in a community um, in China and in Hong Kong, which is increasingly um, subject to mafioso type um, attitudes by by the government. What is wrong with giving the concept of democracy to younger children? Children's clothing chain owner Herbert Chow knows all too well about what he calls white terror pressure. He erected this statue in solidarity with the pro-democracy demonstrators in one of his 13 Hong Kong shops. I think it is the darkest time for a tiny little medium, small medium enterprise guy to speak up. It is very, very dark. Can your business survive? It's not the most important point anymore. I think the, number, the biggest thing I want to do in this uh, as a follow-up exercise is to tell the small and medium enterprises that it is okay to speak up. Shortly after this interview, though, Chow was evicted by the landlord for what he says was, quote, pure political suppression. The mall operator, though, tells Bloomberg it was, quote, purely a business decision not to renew the lease that expired June 30th. This is Hong Kong. This is not China. Right. I, I, I think uh, this is getting out of control. They will pay for this. By they, of course, I mean the Hong Kong government and its uh, uh, Beijing boss. They are, in effect, shooing international investors away from Hong Kong. Businesses uh, probably won't be targeted uh, initially, but I think the great fear is that it's a weapon now uh, that once unsheathed, you know, once the Pandora's box is open, it could easily be used in the future. They will not kill 
the, uh, Hong Kong, the, the, Hong Kong's such a, a special, unique place, and they will not destroy that. If they did, my God, I can imagine the ramifications around the world. Coming up, what does the future hold for Hong Kong? Will we see another wave of immigration like what we saw in the run-up to the 1997 handover? Or will there be better job prospects closer to home across the border in China? So many people are saying this is the end of Hong Kong and uh, I've heard it too often to believe it anymore. Everybody loses the freedom. That's why people on the ground are very worried. They either emigrate or to stay and fight. We made clear, Mr. Speaker, that if China continued down this path, we would reintroduce a new route for those with British national overseas status to enter the UK, granting them limited leave to remain with the ability to live and work in the UK and thereafter to apply for citizenship. And that is precisely what we will do now. I'm very neutral. I never do any protests and I never against China. I love China. I'm proud to be a Chinese, honestly. But in some way, I feel that it is kind of different. The different make me think that maybe I need to have some backup plan. Welcome back to Hong Kong On Edge 2 on Bloomberg Television. I'm Stephen Engel. These BNO passports were issued pre-handover, but they did not give Hong Kong residents UK citizenship. And only those born before the 1997 handover were eligible, which rules out many of today's younger protesters. Beijing has blasted the UK's move now to allow a path to citizenship for BNO passport holders and vows to retaliate. History has played a, a rather unpleasant joke on Hong Kong. It's through British colonialism, Hong Kong people have managed to learn about rule of law, human rights, democracy, all those universal values which are absent as we see it in mainland China. This is a good move to provide a lifeboat for Hong Kongers, but I think uh, instead of just focusing on the worst scenario or the nightmare of Hong Kong and everyone need to find a lifeboat, more important right now is for world leaders to put pressure on Beijing. For the Brits, some of them, I think, they feel that, wow, gee, we handed millions of people over into the hands of a communist dictatorship. That's the question I put to Maggie Thatcher in December of 1984. And now they say, gee, that's terribly terribly wrong. So anyway, I think we need to engage the international community, but I wasn't born yesterday. I know they look after their interests, but their interest is also here. I meet people all the time from Hong Kong. They always said to me, should we stay in, in Hong Kong, um, Governor Patton? Do you think it'll be all right there? And it, it's a very difficult question for me to answer, but I tried to answer it as positively as possible. I'm just not sure how I would answer that question honestly today. I hope I could say um, it'll all be fine, but um, uh, I wouldn't want to bet my house on it. I do not understand the logic, Steve. Does London have national security law? So at the end of the day, for our young people, it is whether we can, whether they would be able to realize their ambition, follow their dream, in Hong Kong. We heard them. Uh, last year, the uh, turmoil did have effect. The deep-seated issues here. You mentioned about the expensive housing price. Uh, we also heard about the difficulty uh, in terms of upward mobility. We will tackle those issues. With all due respect, people who have made it yes. in Hong Kong, and this is a city of commerce and business. Absolutely. Those who have the houses up on the peak and who are in these towers, yes. they've made it. They feel pretty protected. Correct. It's those who are protesting in Mong Kok, in Causeway Bay, yeah. the youngsters who yes. feel they have no future. They feel they have no stake, and they don't have any money, and they yes. don't have any fast track uh, to success. And they're just being told, trust us. Yes, you're right. You have a lot of people who are they don't see future for themselves. They don't, they don't trust the government. They don't trust China. Those 
tycoons or those people who are living on the peak who have money, most of them came here with nothing and went through difficult times. Those people that had the guts to go out and either start a business or do something and, and really make it, make it to the big time, um, they also suffer through all these same kind of things. When I hear kids say, I have no future, I kind of get like, why? I mean, you make your own future. It's not made for you. It's not handed to you. Hong Kong has been successful because of the young, articulate, uh, internationalized talent pool. And if they're leaving, that's bad for Hong Kong as a global international well, hub, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I, I agree with you completely that the the biggest asset we have here are the people. I don't think those they're going to leave. And we, the best example is the handover. In 1997 and lead up to it, probably the five, six years before that, everybody said, that's the end, we've got to get another passport, we'll go to Canada, England, where whoever will take us. And, and as you know, a massive number of them did. But we also know that a lot of them came back because they saw the opportunities of their, their fortunes here. Officials have touted the benefits of their Greater Bay Initiative to further integrate the manufacturing and increasingly innovative regions of southern China with Macau and Hong Kong. The hardware is in place with a lengthy new bridge and a high-speed rail link. Now they just need to get the people on board. This offers further development opportunities for Hong Kong because this area altogether, the population is big 70 million. Aggregate GDP about 1.7 trillion US dollar, uh, comparable to the size of Korea. I think that that will become an absolute powerhouse in the world in terms of technology development. In, in many, many ways. One of my electioneering slogans is say no to mainlandization of Hong Kong. That Hong Kong mustn't just uh, become uh, uh, another Chinese city. We're not Shenzhen. Uh, they want to absorb Hong Kong into this great Bay uh, grand scheme, uh, which is going to be like a black hole, will be sucked into uh, uh, forever. But isn't the, that the future? It's inevitable, isn't it? Th th that's what I'm I mean, thinking. The, the In five years, Hong Kong may not uh, be relevant. We do encourage our young people in the innovative sector, if they want to set up business, do the startup, to go across the border. In Shenzhen, there are certain facilities for them to use. But again, it's across the border. So the, the best path to prosperity for the young people is integration with mainland China. Well, I think the most important uh, attributes that our young people in the future need to possess is mobility. No matter it is going to across the border or going to different uh, areas that offer opportunities. That is the future of Hong Kong. I honestly feel that at the end of the day, at the moment, we're on like an airplane with a lot of turbulence. Everybody's holding on, waiting for the plane to land. But in most cases, the plane lands safely. Or waiting for it to crash. Yeah, or waiting for it to crash. But I honestly feel that this airplane is not going to crash because China needs Hong Kong. They need an open Hong Kong. They're not going to change the mode here. They just want to keep it safe. They want to make it stronger. Beijing surely, though, doesn't want a stronger pro-democracy camp. Before the passage of the national security law, pan-democrat lawmakers had been accused of using disruptive and filibustering tactics while fostering anti-China sentiment. Playing cards similar to those the U.S. government put out in Iraq during the second Gulf War have circulated here singling out the faces of pro-democracy advocates, including the human rights lawyer Albert Ho, the ace of hearts. There will be a lot of scaring tactics. Many people are being scared away. You know, um, they want to defeat you without using, using any force or even without waging any war. That is, that is the way the, the Chinese play, you know, um, the game. If I sit here and say, no, I will never be arrested. You say, Emily Lau, were you born yesterday? <laughs> you live under communist rule. How dare you say a thing? I've never said that even in 1997, but neither did I predict that, oh, I will be arrested tomorrow. No, we live under Chinese rule. So anything, everything that happened, I mean, would not surprise us because that's the way they behave to their own people. But we will stay and fight. I don't think I'm going to leave even though I know I'm facing imminent risk being put into jail. Um, 
Because, you know, if I become scared, all the other people will all the more become, you know, um, uh, very scared. But then the whole community will be stifled. I have no plan to move Hong Kong, and we need to fight until the last minute. According to the anti-subversion regulation, before the national security law implemented in Hong Kong, this interview is legal. But after the national security law implemented in Hong Kong, this interview might be illegal, and not only arresting me, even arrest you. <laughs> Freedom of speech is, is indeed limited by this new law, but it is mainly the freedom to advocate Hong Kong independence, or the freedom to advocate overthrowing the Chinese Communist Party. So, so I, I must uh, admit that there is some limitation of freedom of speech. Is freedom of the press under threat? No. No? No, unless they involve in secession, subversion, or terrorist activities. But do people have to be worried about what they post on Facebook, what they post on social media, in what so companies and their employees post? Uh, yes, or... yes. I don't think you have the uh, uh, fiducial uh, obligation for what your what criminal offense your staff um, commits. But the point is, if you are not involved with, if you have no intention to carry out secession, subversion, and, and your terrorist acts, then what, what have you to fear about? Free speech will always be the first casualty, whether it's for journalists, whether it's for academics, for political activists, or for business people, anybody. One day, when the whole of Hong Kong is silenced, when all, everybody becomes obedient, just speak the voice of the leaders, just clap their hands to support the government, that will be the end to Hong Kong. As contradicting visions for Hong Kong's future are feverishly debated, the issue of legacies and ultimately how history will view the one country, two systems framework will be even harder to pin down. I hope I'll be able to come back one day because I um, loved Hong Kong. It was the most important uh, job I've ever done. And I love the city. It's one of the greatest cities in the world. And I weep at the prospect of it being destroyed. I hope that people will remember uh, in whichever position, facing whatever difficulties, my heart goes to the people of Hong Kong. While still nominally the top decision maker on most local issues, the chief executive of Hong Kong from now on will be more closely supervised by mainland officials, from the local liaison office all the way on up to the Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office in Beijing, both of which have new leaders with hardline credentials. That, along with the national security law, makes it very clear Beijing is taking more hands-on control of this former British colony. For Hong Kong on Edge 2, I'm Stephen Engel. Thanks for watching.